Brandon Ingram's future in New Orleans has been in question with the issue of a contract extension looming over the Pelicans offseason and rumors of a potential trade circulating in recent weeks. The question lies in whether or not Ingram is worth the four-year $208 million contract extension that he's eligible for, if the Pelicans should make that offer, or if another team should try and trade for him in order to offer that extension to him. It's unlikely that you're going to find many people claiming that Brandon Ingram is a bad player, but that's not the question. And the truth is, the question of how much the Pelicans should be willing to give him and how much he'd theoretically be worth on the trade market is actually a pretty complicated question to answer. There's some uncomfortable aspects of Brandon Ingram's game that make it a little bit difficult for the Pelicans to justify extending him with the intention of keeping him around long term. The Pelicans are at an important crossroads as a team where they need to decide if they should continue to build around Ingram and Zion as their primary two pieces, but there's some flaws with that direction, which is why it seems like the Pelicans are willing to entertain some offers for him. The issue is not about if Brandon Ingram is good enough to build around alongside Zion. The issue is that if you give Brandon Ingram that max extension that he's eligible for, will you still have enough money to build around him and Zion? And it's a lot more difficult to build around Ingram and Zion because of his style of play. The Pelicans attempted the eighth fewest threes in the NBA last year with a three-point attempt rate of 34%. For perspective, the average three-point attempt rate last year was 36.3%. Why is this important and how does it relate to Brandon Ingram? Well, the easy answer is that the modern NBA landscape necessitates teams shooting a high volume of threes to be successful. But that's not always true. Denver was last in three-point attempt rate last year, Oklahoma City was just barely ahead of New Orleans in three-point attempt rate, and Minnesota was just barely ahead of them. Yet all of those teams experienced more success than the Pelicans this past season. It's not necessarily the fact that the Pelicans don't shoot very many threes. It's the fact that Brandon Ingram doesn't, and considering Zion is also a predominantly paint-oriented scorer, Having two main options that don't demand a meaningful amount of attention out to the perimeter is kind of problematic. To fully maximize Zion Williamson's strengths, he needs the most space possible to create advantages. The same can be said for Brandon Ingram. Creating in the mid-range and leveraging his solid post footwork and finishing ability is made a lot more difficult if he doesn't have quality spacing. One of these guys being low volume from three may not be an issue. Both of them being low volume from three is. When Zion drives, he's typically going to demand pretty aggressive nail help like we see from Contavious Caldwell Pope here. The result is Brandon Ingram being left open one pass away, and he usually has a relatively decent look for a catch and shoot three, but you'll oftentimes see him pass up these threes to try and dribble into a mid-range look. They've got a nice inverted empty side pick and roll, and Barnes is going to sag pretty heavily off of Ingram in the corner. And theoretically, this should be an easy catch and shoot look for Ingram, but instead he tries to attack Barnes off the dribble instead of taking the open look that was given to him. Zion draws two in transition, and he kicks it to Ingram trailing him on the break, and you could argue that a three in transition isn't always the best choice, but neither is dribbling towards Bain waiting for him at the elbow and taking a contested jumper instead of an open three. Ingram is getting open looks from beyond the arc, but he's not taking them when he's getting them. And it would be a different story if he were inefficient on catch and shoot looks from beyond the arc, but that's just simply not the case. This past season, he shot 36.9% on catch and shoot threes, and the year prior, he was a 41.7% catch and shoot three point shooter. We know that he can make them, but he's not taking them, which is the issue. Let's even rewind to the 2019 2020 season, his first year in New Orleans. He was attempting the most threes of his career with 6.2 a night, and he shot 39.1%. That's not just good perimeter shooting, that's borderline elite. And if he were able to return to this level, it likely solves a lot of problems for New Orleans. But the context of his higher volume from five years ago is really important. He was the beneficiary of a guy like Lonzo who was able to set the table for him it's painfully noticeable how much his spot up volume from three has changed over the years. And it's likely a big contributor to the inconsistency in his perimeter shooting. And you might ask yourself, 
isn't he a good enough mid-range shooter to negate the fact that he's opting for mid-range looks instead of threes? Well, let's unpack that a little bit. Last season, he shot 47% on long mid-range jumpers and 49% on short mid-range jumpers. That's highly efficient. It's among the best in the league. We all know that Brandon Ingram can knock down mid-range shots with the best of them. The question is, is that as valuable to the Pelicans as him taking more catch and shoot threes and potentially operating more as a floor spacer at times if necessary? Based on his numbers last season, he shot 47.5% on dribble jumpers inside the arc. That comes out to 0.95 points per shot. His 36.9% efficiency on catch and shoot threes last year comes out to 1.11 points per shot. So from that perspective, yes, a Brandon Ingram catch and shoot three is more valuable than him attempting a mid-range jumper off the dribble. But from a more tangible perspective, think about what this means for defenses. When you have Brandon Ingram one pass away from Zion with the ball in his hands, you get some free advantages. You can be a little bit more aggressive showing an extra body on Zion because you know if he kicks to Ingram waiting on the perimeter one pass away, you're probably not going to be punished for helping off of him. He's more likely to look for a mid-range jumper instead, and considering the math, even if he makes it, you live with it because you just gave up two points instead of three. It makes life harder for Zion too, and easier for opposing defenses. And all of this blame is not on Brandon Ingram. This problem is very much exacerbated by other personnel issues in New Orleans. The issue of lineup optimization was actually an underlying narrative for the Pelicans the entire season. How can you create space for Zion and Ingram to operate with when you have both of them on the floor together? What's odd is the fact that Zion and Ingram have a net rating of plus 2.2 when they're sharing the floor, but when Ingram is on without Zion, that number comes out to plus 6.8, and when Zion is on without Ingram, they have a net rating of plus 2.8. You could come away from these numbers with the interpretation that the Pelicans are better with Ingram on and Zion off, but that would probably be a little bit irresponsible. Trying to figure out who's to blame in these lineups is unproductive. More pertinent is the fact that neither of these guys are able to truly leverage their strengths because of the lineup context they're having to operate in. They both spent a lot of their time on the floor together also being flanked by either Valanchunas or Larry Nance Jr., which further complicates their spacing issues. Even though I think Herb Jones has wildly improved as a perimeter shooter, his volume of threes is still too low for it to have significant spacing implications for opposing defenses when it comes to second guessing whether or not to send an extra body onto Zion or Ingram. It's really easy to point at his low three-point volume because it's a legitimate flaw relative to this current iteration of the Pelicans, but it is not the problem. New Orleans just isn't surrounding Ingram and Zion with high volume catch and shoot guys, and it makes the fact that both of them are more inside the arc scores less of a strength and more of a weakness. It's pretty likely that if they did have the right personnel around these two, then this situation looks a lot different. Both would be afforded more space to work with, further opening things up for Zion to create as a downhill score, as well as opening things up for Ingram to create in the mid-range. But since they haven't put those two in that kind of situation, they're now faced with a new question try to reshuffle the roster to optimize things for Ingram and Zion more, or trade or let Ingram walk to try and simplify a path forward around Zion and now DeJounte Murray. And that's where things get really confusing is with DeJounte Murray. You look at Murray in Atlanta, and of course you had the seemingly incompatible styles of him and Trey Young, you kind of wonder what the Pelicans see that warranted them making a move for him. At least from an outsider's perspective, it seems like DeJounte Murray is more interested in an on-ball role as opposed to a more supporting cast type of role at this point in his career. Given that the Pelicans still have Zion and Ingram as well, it complicates things further and makes Ingram's future more uncertain. If I were to venture to guess, New Orleans probably sees Murray as a cleaner fit than Ingram due to the higher volume of threes, as well as the possibility of getting more out of him defensively. It's worth pointing out too that Murray is roughly about the same in terms of mid-range efficiency as Brandon Ingram. 
Murray, Ingram, and Zion is a really unconventional three-man lineup to say the least, and you don't get the full potential of these guys unless one of them is willing to fully buy into a role as a more connective piece. Ingram has expressed his desire to have somebody alongside him that's capable of better setting him up than they've had over the last few years, somebody similar to what Lonzo was for him. Maybe that's what the Pelicans see in DeJounte Murray. But that doesn't negate the financial issues of giving Ingram a four-year, $208 million contract extension. The Pelicans end up in dangerous territory if they lock themselves in as a luxury tax team due to the strict rules and restrictions that the new CBA imposes on teams that exceed the first and second apron. Brandon Ingram can still be a part of their long-term future, but it's likely going to have to be at the right price. Otherwise, they may be better off trading him or just letting him walk. Really hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, I'd really appreciate it if you considered leaving a like and subscribing. It seriously helps me out so much. Regardless, thank you guys for watching and I'll see you in the next one.